Well, th this session has been uh, being jointly led by myself and Ruben Bardanian to my right. Um, he and I come from backgrounds in relation to this topic, which I think are neatly complementary. He's a, a businessman and a philanthropist of some distinction in both respects from Russia. I was brought up in the Cold War United States, um, and I'm not a businessman, and I'm an exploiter of philanthropists rather than being a philanthropist myself. So um, I, I, I think we have, uh, we're, we're neatly uh, balancing each other uh, in respect of this session. So um, uh, we're going to uh, provide first myself uh, and then Ruben uh, brief introductions to the topic. Then we're going to have breakout groups and we're going to be joined in leading those breakout groups by Sir Colin Lucas, former warden of Rhodes House, and also by Marvin Krisloff, president of Oberlin College, and uh, Alice Prohaska, who of course has already spoken uh, the principal of Somerville. And then, as we did in the last session, there'll be reports back, so each group, each of the breakout groups needs to appoint or anoint, perhaps, a um, uh, rapporteur, and then we'll have a, a session back here. Uh, this session is what's standing between you and drinks, so we understand the solemnity of that responsibility, but uh, as Ross said, I think it, it's clearly an important topic. Now, by way of my introduction, um, it seems to me that the objective of this session is to make suggestions about how far and how universities in Africa and Asia can further develop fundraising. Now, of course, we're not assuming that there's an absence of such fundraising from private sources among the very diverse uh, universities of these two enormous continents, and quite clearly in some universities in Africa and Asia, such fundraising is already well advanced, perhaps especially among the research universities, to go back to that typology from previous sessions. Though I think it's clear that in many uh, universities in Africa and Asia, uh, such private fundraising is not especially well developed. It may, of course, be that it's not either practicable or desirable for all such universities to go down this path. I think that's something that we need to discuss. We're not automatically assuming that the models of private fundraising developed in North America, Europe, and Australasia are relevant for Africa and Asia. In a sense, that's the question that we're hoping to examine uh, in a critical fashion, because, of course, as has already appeared in the conference in various ways, there are, uh, although there's important similarities among universities throughout the world, there's some very great differences in terms of the environments in which they operate. Uh, the political environment, the financing of higher education and taxation, to mention just three. But still, I, th I think this issue, or set of issues, is very much worth pursuing, partly because there has been such rapid growth, um, not just in my native country, uh, the USA, but also well beyond in other uh, countries in uh, Europe and, and elsewhere in recent decades. Um, university fundraising, which used to be seen as something um, more or less restricted to private US universities, has galloped ahead in all sorts of other contexts, the state universities of the United States, many other uh, developed countries in uh, North America and uh, in Europe, including in the UK, which if we had been having the session uh, 50 years ago or even 40 years ago or even 30 years ago, perhaps would be seen as a place where uh, private fundraising didn't have all that much relevance. Um, we've put in the booklet of readings uh, for this session uh, the executive summary of the Pierce report on university fundraising in the UK. I was a member of that panel which reported three years ago and which noted that although there was still a long way to go to pull up to the level of many private American universities, that fundraising in UK universities had advanced substantially in the preceding decade. And there have been similar 
diffusions of this kind of practice to continental European countries and elsewhere uh, in the meantime. And I think it's uh, g given that there has been this rise of um, this form of private fundraising in many such university systems, and as there is increasing contact and collaboration between, for want of a better phrase, Western universities and those in Africa and Asia, uh, I think it's well worth examining uh, this question. It seems to me that the, the final thing I might do by way of this introduction is to um, identify what seem to me the key characteristics of university fundraising from private sources as it has developed in the West. And obviously I'm generalizing in a very crude fashion here. Um, one thing I think we can say is that uh, there has been a significant increase in the income secured. Uh, Rolf Dietrich gave us an estimate, I think that was for North America, of 10% of university income, which by anybody's standards is very high. Um, I think it's also clear that the, this has, on the whole, um, if not universally, had very substantial positive impact on the scope and the quality of university activities. In the great majority of cases, and of course the donors wouldn't keep coming if this were not the case, in the great majority of cases, the institutions, even those who are nominally publicly owned and funded, have been able to keep the proceeds of their fundraising. There is a complex question that Rolf mentioned of the extent to which such uh, fundraising is replacing uh, depleted public uh, funding, though I think, as he pointed out, it's often a rise in tuition fees, which is more often making up that shortfall. But the ability of these institutions to keep the funding um, is obviously a crucial part of the mix. The f having favorable, or at least not hostile, tax regimes seems to be another important part of the model. Um, a little notice part of that uh, uh, now not much lamented, a British politician, Gordon Brown, uh, was his, the fact that during his 10 years as Chancellor of the Exchequer, up until he became Prime Minister in 2007, that he substantially liberalized UK tax law as it affected private donations, including donations uh, to universities. And I think it's clear that in this country anyway, that liberalization has been an important prerequisite for um, a rise in, in uh, uh, successful university fundraising. That's not to say it's necessarily be true in every country, but it's a very encouraging bit of the context. Another important feature of this, uh, what I'm calling the Western model, is the increasing use of professional fundraising staffs, um, which are evolving, not just in the United States, but also in countries like the UK, into a sort of a uh, university fundraising profession which overlaps and intersects with a broader fundraising profession that relates to the so-called third or charitable sector. There's also the important question of the role of the heads of institutions. And through them, the integration of fundraising into the strategies and operations of universities more generally, very much including their relations with their alumni. The point's often been made that successful fundraising is not just a matter of devoting time and person power to it, uh, but also a question of changing uh, the culture, um, developing a culture of fundraising in an institution and then eventually with the, uh, the pool uh, of donors. Uh, that's obviously a prerequisite, though I think the rapid change in behavior in the UK shows that such cultures are not uh, fixed in stone. Um, uh, people have often forgotten that down to the Second World War, um, the UK universities largely depended on private philanthropy and on tuition fees to finance themselves. There was nothing in the DNA of the British people that made them inimical to uh, charitable fundraising for universities or for anything else. And even if there was a a set pattern of behavior in the opposite direction in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, things rapidly moved in the, the other direction. 
A further feature is that although there has been a tendency to uh, cultivate alumni in particular, that uh, university, successful fundraising universities in what I'm calling the West have also looked to people and institutions beyond their own campuses, uh, non-alumni individuals and, of course, very importantly, foundations of various kinds. Now, finally, I want to say that I, I'm not intending in any way to produce a kind of Panglossian vision here of university fundraising as it's developed in these countries, that it's all straightforward, it, it's an inevitable uh, rise, or that it's without its uh, negative aspects, uh, because there uh, is the issue of potential harm to university reputations. There are those people who believe that uh, philanthropy can distract universities from their genuine academic missions and so on, and that might be an issue uh, that we want to discuss. But anyway, th those are one person's sort of stab at some of the characteristics of the successful model in the West that we might then want to examine critically in terms of its relevance for uh, African and Asian universities. My own hunch um, is that there is considerable potential for um, uh, spreading uh, fundraising in African and Asian universities, or at least in some of them, to go back to the discussion we've had in the previous sessions about different types of universities, maybe this kind of model is more applicable to research universities in Africa and Asia than to other universities. I think that's something that we might want to discuss. So my hunch, it's no more than that, is that the, there is considerable positive scope for applying aspects of this model, but a model that would have to be substantially modified for the quite different situations in which African and Asian universities compared, say, to European and American universities uh, find themselves. So that's the end of my introduction. So Ruben, may I invite you to give yours? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. I'm not a Rhodes alumni, but I'm very glad to be here. <coughs> I hope you will forgive me for my uh, <coughs> deep voice and uh, not very clear thoughts, which I will share with you, especially uh, after a long day. I think it will be <clears throat> not easy for me to give all clear my own views that I want to share with you, but I also hope you will allow me to be a little bit provocative. I'm coming with quite unusual background, being son of professor and grandson of professor. I started my <clears throat> career in the Soviet system, and when the Soviet Union collapsed, I became, in 22 years old, uh, investment banker, and uh, <clears throat> 10 years ago, I raised $600 million to build the business school and um, with the Lee Kuan Yew becoming our board member with some other people worldwide, John Brown, other people supporting our school. Uh, three years ago I raised $200 million with my wife to, raise, to build a school in Armenia, which is high school. So I am, in one hand I am son from the Soviet system. I know how Russia operates and I'm being an investment banker knowing how the West world work. At the same time, being an investment banker, entrepreneur, and philanthropist. And if I may, I share my, <coughs> not only thoughts, but also some questions, which, uh, to be honest, I'm a little bit confused hearing today what I heard today from a discussion, which was very interesting. But from my point of view, it's a little bit <coughs> out of the key. We're not touching, touching very key, important points. Um, one of them, which I believe it's a, linked to the philanthropy issue is about the role of university in our society. When the Robert Barnes and other rich people put the very big amount of money to build the American universities, and this time the professor and university was very highly respected institution in society and very exclusive and very sacral. This is why it created a lot of attention and interest for people who become rich and some of them made money, uh, not maybe the best way, uh, what they can report, to be one to part of this process. They try to be associated with them, this is why we invest money, not, to be, not only because of the tax issue, but also because they want to be part of something which was respected. And I think the role of university was not only just research, its role was also the knowledge place and the exclusivity place. Now we have a standardization of the product. University becoming standard, university becoming some standard product delivery. 
this is why it's becoming too many universities. This is why one of the key questions for all of us while they're talking about philanthropy, how you can continue to keep this type of exclusivity with the people who become rich in the private sector and want to continue to give money, with, especially, especially in the countries where we don't have a strong government. Because one other element, which was also in the British Empire or the United States, was like government, was very strong. And they push a lot, very, very heavily some of the rich people saying, you need to be give back. Most of the countries we're talking is not have a strong institutions. They have a government usually quite weak. It's very personal. That's why the second problem that I see is uh, no enough strong institutions around uh, in, in places that we want to build universities. The third, you want to form a, when you want to build university, you think, you're talking about not only just creating the knowledge-based center, but talking about creating the elite. That's why it's a long-term commitment for your own country. And being long-term committed in the country is very vulnerable, and a lot of things change, and people not convinced about themselves to be part of this uh, country. It's creating a big challenge because it's a short-term orientation of the people who make the money and all companies operating in this country because they can shut down the company branches very quickly and go to some other places. As I say, short-term, no institutionalization, and no any more uh, exclusivity creating big challenge about how you can do universities in the places where there is no base for it. The second point I want to make is one question. I don't like this terminology about Asia and Africa. It's a little bit, I, and I mentioned it in the discussion, we're simplifying very, it's Asia and Africa is not like one country in one the same type of countries. We have a very different countries with different background, different history. Different type of their attitude to research, to science. And the same about Europe. When you're talking about Europeans, where we're putting Germany, England, and Albania putting the same, it's not right. It's not, it's not, I, I don't like geographic division. I don't think it's right. I don't think geographic division by analysis about how we can help to build a good university. We need to divide by different slices. How we can build good universities in the countries which are trying to build their own future or in a in developing state. Whatever we can. But, Comparing now South Korea and Greece, I will not suggest because the South Korea will beat the Greece, okay, with the 10 times. And by the way, South Korea 50 years ago has zero chance to be successful because of the education problem. So we are talking about something which is much more complex and saying about Asia and Africa. I will suggest to go not by geographic division, but something different. The other point I will say also very critical is, um, is technology transformation. Look. The young kids becoming very rich in a very young age without graduation university. The, 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 again, the part of the, all this exclusivity, which was you need to go to university, you need to graduate university, you need to become successful only when you become, is becoming less irrelevant. And what we change, what, do, do we see any changes in our education model, our university model, despite of the industrial era is over, we are living in the information era, and is university the same way managed? By the way, we can talk about management. It's a very key issue, I think, a problem. The corporate governance university is one of the worst in corporate governance system about transparency and clearness about who is making which decision. I'm not saying it's a bad system because it's sustainable and showing it's work, but from the point of the transparency, it's not transparent. Now, we're saying, okay, it's a tradition, it's legacy, but the world has changed. Are we, are, are we reacting for transformation that's going around us by technology, by the society, by this type of the new type of the uh, relation, and the, uh, by the way, we becoming younger generation, becoming more and more involved in uh, some area of which we didn't be, didn't be involved before. Because most of the philanthropy before was the, in age after 70 years old, the person wants to give legacy, give the money because he was feeling guilty or he feel not good about what he did in doing his life, or he, because he feels right for the country future. I don't want to mean only negative. But anyway, it was the person who will be giving more and more after he passed away. Today, we see more and more people like, like, like Jeff Skoll, who is here, and again, we can see more people doing now themselves, and they want to be very clear about how money will be spent, efficiency, corporate governance, transparency. It's all questions becoming very critical for university, and how university can be responding for this type of the question is becoming a big, big issue. Is a university continuing to stay as it is, or is it to become also transforming because of the demand of the ex external environment putting it in us? And I think it's a good question because not always everything needs to be changed because of some new uh, things coming. But without transformation, without discussing this issue about corporate governance, about role of the professors, or role of the students, 
role of the space that we were studying. Again, role, role of research, what kind of research? Because research now, before the, the research was done by government sponsoring or by, because it was artificial money was putting, because we need, the science needs to be developed. Now, the most of research can be used by commercialization. It's coming, who will we have a right to this? Who intellectual right will be? Many questions which was before was less important, becoming more and more critical for the, also in research. That's why I say, talking about this problem of university financing, we need to understand this. University not is an isolated institution out of the, what's going around us. The, the government's changing, the, the institutions around the uh, university is changing. Universities themselves establishing and developing in the countries which no institutions are becoming a big challenge. Um, I will say it's a other point I want to make, which is I think is very important for our discussion. We're talking about research institutions, but we're talking like about music, you know. In the 12th century, Italian guy developed the musical uh, notes, how to play European music. I want to remind you that Chinese gar musical harmony is different compared to European. And why we believe our research system, our approach to the research, is only one approach that needs to be right. It's why we're doing comparison. We're doing comparison between our research and saying, oh, we don't have a research. We're not in a rating. It's wrong, because some of the research can, doesn't need to be part of the global research. We're talking about research that needs to be done for the countries or for regions, where they have a different culture, different type of historical legacy, which we can continue to do what we've been doing ourselves. The, uh, one other point I want to say is about uh, is partnership. I mean, say we're talking about this philanthropy and building a lot of um, horizontal links between the big, best Oxford to Cambridge, whatever, Hell, Yale, Harvard, with the uh, developing world. But I think the most challenging challenge for them is the building relation between themselves. In Chinese universities, you cannot get barely any information about India or about Vietnam or about, and they're not exchanging the ideas. They're not doing the horizontal linkage between the countries which were neighbors, we don't come together doing research. That's why putting the pressure to how to make this all workable is becoming very important for, I think, the future of universities. The last point I want to make about the uh, universities, um, we're all talking about now sitting here where is a capex already done. I raised 600 million dollars cash to build a school. And now, after three, five years, it's operationally self-sustainable, you can go endowment fund. That's why we don't, don't forget about the philanthropy, where is you're doing some of the uh, first step, CapEx is becoming a very significant amount of money which you don't just do by endowment. So by the big amount of money which needs to be raised immediately for short term becomes a very, very important issue. Anyway, uh, I would say it's, 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 a, it's an interesting, I think very important and very critical discussion about how the private institutions, how private sector can be involved in uh, supporting the government who needs to continue to support the academical science and research and universities, and how the government, who being one of the key driver of universities, needs to be involved, being not self-efficient themselves, and how they, their relations between government and universities become a big question. Because before it was very clear, the old model was university needs to be as much as possible autonomy and independent from the government, getting money from government, but being autonomically independent, and try to be more not part of the political pressure. Today, is universities have less and less freedom by the way, the pressure from the legislation, from the press, from the all, creating big, big also burden for the universities and cost of running university going up significantly compared to uh, earlier because of those additional costs that you need to care about as all the uh, legal and other uh, expenses that you care, especially in the developed world. That's why I'll say we are, in my opinion, a little missing the part of the discussion especially about how to get money. We're not talking about other elements, which for me, and I'm, again, forgive me, I, I'm, the bank, I'm the business person. We're talking more about our own university problems without looking at ourselves from outside view, how other people are looking at us. Thank you. Good afternoon to all of you. Welcome back. I, I suppose uh, the individual groups and the breakout sessions went well, and I would like to invite the rapporteurs, the volunteers, to come and present some of the perspectives that are brought uh, into those discussions. Uh, we, were, we had very able chairs uh, in our session, and uh, I suppose one of them could come and uh, brief for the benefit of others 
Yeah, please. very wide-ranging um, session and discussion about the role of the university leader um, and the changing role of the university leader in securing um, uh, funding from philanth philanthropic sources. Um, we thought that increasingly, at least it, on the UK-US model, that this not only includes direct fundraising but also incredibly important role in influencing policy and Rick earlier on talked about the Brown policy in, um, in the previous Labour government, or the one before that actually, um, in, in, in the tax regime, but also um, in ensuring appropriate governance and transparency around funding. We heard that 90% of funding comes from 10% of the people, which I think raised questions about accountability, institutional values, and an and institutional mission creep. I think, I think, Raj, you argued that one of the issues for many uh, universities in Asia and Africa, um, or for, for, for some of the university leaders in those countries, is that they've become comfortable in their reliance on the state. Um, and that this constrains them as individuals, but it also constrains the universities in appointing leaders with badly needed new kinds of, of skill sets. Uh, Alice raised the question about partnership and whether we could do more um, in terms of partnership. And I have to admit, when she first raised this question, I, I was a little bit sceptical and I thought about the very competitive nature that exists amongst universities, at least here, here in the UK, and, and Marvin said the same about the US. But then actually we heard that there are some real models of partnership that are leading to success in this area either because the funders themselves are requiring us to collaborate in order to be successful in funding, but also because I think we could create interesting models of universities collaborating across, across regions um, um, in order to develop projects that philanthropists would find attractive. There was a lot more in that session. Well, we were the first group looking at uh, the role of established models, and we had a very good discussion. And I noted six points. The first point was actually to agree with uh, Ruben's provocation that actually there is a heck of a lot of differentiation, not just between Africa and Asia, but uh, within countries and across countries. So. Um, we noted that some universities, and two were mentioned, for example, Cape Town and Hong Kong University, are pretty much like developed universities in the West. So they could use the more current established models based on alumni fund giving and so on and so forth. So we focused more on the other universities, which probably have less of an established uh, alumni base. And if they do have alumni, they're not going to be so wealthy or so numerous. So the second point we felt was that alumni should be used as part of a wider institutional stakeholder group as connectors. And connectors would include diaspora, uh, very important because they have a whole range of extra con uh, contacts, alumni um, and staff and faculty, and we'd use these to reach some of the so-called others who could be potentially rich donors, philanthropic donors. So that was a, a key, key idea we had. Um, we then came back to the theme of partnerships, which perhaps um, we noted is, is the underlying theme of the whole conference. And we asked ourselves, how can universities, these slightly below the top level elite universities, how can these universities make themselves more attractive to outside donors, foundations, and philanthropists. Um, and uh, we felt that uh, they had to, one idea, which is, which is apparently growing, is that, they, that donors and, and uh, philanthropists should, should be more interested in supporting partnerships that perhaps linked one of our universities with a more developed university. And this should be a real institutional partnership, not as quite often seems to happen, 
where you get a professor from a particular university linked to another professor and they benefit, their research benefits, their citations goes up, but the institution doesn't necessarily gain. And we felt that was a sort of more long-term way of benefiting the institution. Um, and related to that, our fourth idea was to actually help develop an, uh, 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 an infrastructure so that uh, institutions could become better at fundraising, so that they could know how to make submissions, how to do grant accounting and so on. And we noted that there are organizations like CASE, a well-known international body that runs conferences, professional uh, um, events, showing people how to do better fundraising. And perhaps we should work to provide more bursaries and so on so that individuals from our target group of universities could, set, could go to these conferences and bring back knowledge uh, to improve their own developing structures. One idea that was mentioned, which is the same for all universities, is listen carefully to your donors. But also, and this was our final point, always plan for fundraising. Um, we noted that even in so-called developed universities, deans and what have you don't plan enough for the actual fundraising process. But it's all the more important for our target universities to do this so that they can respond to philanthropic approaches and ideas or some of the connections that might come through the door and integrate that into their future development. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. So our group was tackling the African-Asian context, and I must say that we took about a quarter of our session to redefine the question. Um, and we defined it as follows. Um, looking at the African and Asian context, who would be potential donors, and what would be strategies to approach them, and what would be some of the challenges and opportunities in taking forward those strategies? And I would just say that we deliberately set aside any fundraising related to um, research grant financing and so forth. And we also noted that there'd inevitably be a lot of differentiation within the regions that we were talking about. So we came up with um, five different buckets of donors. Development aid being the first, local funders and foundations being the second, expatriate and diaspora communities being the third, international foundations fourth, corporates both local and global being the fifth. And just to delve into a couple of those, on development aid, we noted that um, there's been a shift in the last 10 years or so to recognize, for example, by the World Bank in the w World Development Report in 2003, a reversal in, in mindset and viewing higher education as a, um, not as a luxury, but that's something that is essential for governments to allocate money to. And we all thought that the SDGs and the prioritization of higher education amongst those might make a difference and that most um, countries and universities within them can and should benefit. However, we noted that because most aid goes through government, universities will be very dependent on the quality of their interactions and capabilities to manage governmental relationships. On local funders and um, foundations related to local philanthropists, we noted that this area is growing, so there's potential um, philanthropic support from that area, but that there could be competition with established Western universities. Um, so that's something to be very conscious of. And then the third, uh, third donor category that we delved into a bit was around expatriate and diaspora communities. And we tried to think about what is it that um, generates momentum for those communities to donate. And we thought that often crises um, in specific countries can galvanize action. But that there are specific challenges related to those countries in which the diaspora reside, but also um, the destination countries regarding regulatory frameworks, and that's a challenge to bear in mind. And so Colin would then have us lay out specific donor strategies for each of them by how do you go about approaching them, who asks, what do you ask for, what are the conditions, and then we thought that actually cutting across all of that was some very um, specific challenges. 
And we thought that these aren't just necessarily specific to Africa and Asia, but probably globally as well. And those challenges relate to the capacity to fundraise and the capabilities of universities to build and manage relationships um, and manage the cross-cultural cross complexity and context related to that. The second aspect, and this brings in a point that was mentioned earlier, which is around alumni, that especially if you have alumni of those universities who've gone abroad to study, there can be competing divided allegiances and, against competi and again, competition with um, Western universities for fundraising from alumni. And lastly, institutional weaknesses. Again, this is something that applies across the board, but maladministration, poor reporting, managing donor expectations effectively. So when we thought about potential solutions to address those, we thought that actually, first and foremost, it's about demonstrating differentiation. Before you even think about institutional, institutional weaknesses, it's about demonstrating an exciting proposition that makes sense for that relationship. And then in terms of building the capabilities and capacity um, of universities, we thought that maybe you know, some philanthropic support could go towards training, to think about key network hubs that could support training and mentorship for fundraisers, um, and also to focus not just on implanting ways, models that work in, um, in the US or in Europe, but to focus on South-South capacity building. Um, and I think that's, that's my summary. Did I miss anything out? Oh, thank you very much. That was really fantastic, and uh, the studio is good. So, mm -hmm. yes, we have a fourth group. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but I'll ask somebody from helping me because it will be unfair to you. Because I was answering more questions. To be honest, it was not. <laughs> I don't know. So, if this was like an exam, you got an A plus, we get an F minus because we didn't appoint a scribe. We didn't read the question, but we had a great conversation that did touch on some of the points. I think you know, our, t our topic was, and it was really an expansion anecdotally, as well as some themes that come out of those anecdotes of, of Ruben's experience. Um, you know, the, the focus was, so what is it that philanthropy, that philanthropy can finance? And I mean, there were two things, or a number of things, or two things that I, I recall particularly. The one was, this topic of, of seed funding, so that in order to capacitate and to get the idea, to get it on the ground, to get it going, um, likewise, and, and that was Ruben's experience, and, and so too, speaking from the, the Mandela Rhodes Foundation, our experience where the Rhodes Trust, through their initial seeding and endowment and commitment, cr provided funds that we were then able, off the back of that, to go to other donors to raise an endowment because everything else was already covered and paid for and subsequent donors knew that all of that money was now going to programs, not to administration. So getting the thing going, getting, but in order to be successful, it's not just enough to have the seeding. I mean, the philanthropists, are, uh, the point was made that it's not about leaving a legacy in your will when you die um, later in life and leaving your trustees to work out what it is you wanted your money spent on. Today, the philanthropists, they're here. They're alive, they want to be involved, they're engaged, and they want return. Many people are philanthropists because they've made that money. They made it because they were entrepreneurial and understood about developing ideas, getting returns, creating impact, and they like to see the same thing. So for those wishing to attract philanthropists and getting that kind of do uh, uh, donation um, and support, being very clear about what it is you have to offer in terms of the impact that that money can make, the multiplier effect, the matching that can be added to it uh, is really important. What isn't so important actually, and, and, and so often people would, and certainly not in the, in the developing world, tax, aren't, tax is not necessarily something that drives it. It's, I mean, if, if it's something that you believe in, uh, they, they will support it. We did have a discussion, it was more a social anthropological and psychological discussion around different types of philanthropists and the absence or presence of some in different parts of Africa it goes down to Africa and Asia are not one homogenous place. Um, and there are different experiences and, and certainly we, we've, we've experienced that in Africa uh, in terms of we are yet to see the rise um, of a large-scale uh, sort of philanthropic body of indigenous um, you know, Africans uh, having, a, having an impact. And again, talking from our Mandela Rhodes experience, by far the majority 
of the money we have as sourced from non-South African, African sources. Um, and, and that's the challenge from a development point of view is to say, well, that's what's been enabled. How can we put more back ourselves and build it for ourselves as Africans? Um, but I think that's enough said because we're probably 10 minutes over time and I'm sure our wine's getting warm.